I'm making this video which is inspired by the whole Rachel Dolezal headline because I'm noticing how you have black people who are defending this white woman who has been posing as a black woman for years to the point of obtaining a scholarship at a black university and eventually becoming the head of a black organization, the Spokane Washington chapter of the NAACP. Now, she has been deceiving black people for years now, claiming to be black or to have at least one black parent, although it has been recently confirmed that both of her parents are actually white. Now, despite the fact that she's been deceptive to black people, there are many black people who are defending this white woman and most of these people are black males although i have noticed some black females defending her as well or trying to play down what she's done trying to say that it's no biggie or believing that her imitation of blacks which is basically just blackface is some form of flattery or they just want to believe that it's just about this woman having such a love for our culture, our heritage, our hair, our men, <laughs> our people. I swear it's like black people are so thirsty and desperate to be loved by white people. And this is one of the main reasons why we have so many culture vultures stealing from us and never giving us our due props and recognition because we're always so damn accepting and inclusive, especially when it comes to white females. There are many brothers who I have heard speak of white women as if they are really seen as these minorities who suffer just as much oppression as a woman and they believe that they can't be as racist as a white man and much of the racist shit that they may do like in the case of Emmett Till's accuser is just a case of them being pressured under the white man even Paul Mooney in one of his routines spoke on how Hollywood seems to hate black men and white women considering how white women are always being paired with beasts in films or being slaughtered in films. He believes that this is about Hollywood hating white women, but it's actually more about Hollywood propaganda. The image of the fragile, helpless white woman who every beast is trying to kidnap or sleep with or harm this is what has been helping to keep white men on their toes because like I've said in prior videos the main role of a man or a patriarch is to provide for and protect his woman and family um, I believe that um, the slogan to protect our women and children I believe that that originated with the KKK. I, I recall reading that somewhere, I swear. So it keeps white men on their toes as knights to always show white women as being the ones most likely to be raped, murdered, or victimized in some sort of way. And by some hideous monster or beast. Now, I'm not denying that white women have experienced injustices or unfair treatment under white men considering the white man's sick twisted view of the scriptures and the idea of a patriarchy but white women who are wiser they actually realize how white supremacy can benefit them the most actually today i believe that white women benefit more from white supremacy than even white men. Um, white men, it, it, it's interesting, they have the highest suicide rate. And white women, they realize that, or at least the smarter ones, they realize that they don't have to do all of the dirty work <laughs> um, 
nor do they have to take on any real blame or responsibility for white racism as a whole, although they can be the primary beneficiaries of white supremacy. But considering how it has usually been some story of a white woman supposedly being raped or attacked behind most of the lynchings of black men, and when you consider how Carolyn Bryant, who was the woman who made the accusations against a 14-year-old child, which resulted in his brutal murder, and how she is still living comfortably in her home today, and no one has ever tried or charged her with anything. Oh, yeah, and there's a video on Carolyn Bryant that I want y'all to check out, because there's a white man who knew of the Bryants back then, and he claims that it was known that Carolyn had a reputation for flirting with young men, including black men. And when you consider this recent incident in McKinney and how everyone is overlooking the two white women who attacked a young lady, which led to this whole big old racial incident, which is dividing people more and more across the nation and when you consider what led to the bombing of Tulsa's Black Wall Street and Rosewood Florida the destruction of these um, strong black communities and when you consider the two prostitutes that lied on the Scottsboro Nine and the fact that all of the white women involved in these cases these different incidents that have re have really led to a lot of racial turmoil um, and destruction, you know, and you consider how they have never even had a finger pointed at them for the calamity that they've caused. I think that it's time that we begin to call out white women and their great contribution to white racism and white supremacy. Do y'all remember Cecil B. DeMille's 1950s version of the Ten Commandments? Now, the film was very dramatized, and it wasn't quite biblically accurate. But they had this scene where Pharaoh's wife, Nefertiti, she's getting in the Pharaoh's ear and causing him to harden his heart against the Israelites. Although I know that this isn't biblically correct. And each time that Pharaoh considers letting the people go or freeing the Israelites from bondage, she's over his shoulder, whispering in his ear, making him feel like a defeated coward for even considering to let the Israelites go. Like he's giving in or he's giving up. And she kept on doing this for her own selfish benefit, being that she wanted Moses. Of course, this doesn't go along with the Bible's actual account. However, I'm making the point, using the example of this film, I'm making the point that behind every powerful male ruler, there's usually a female behind him whispering in his ear, although you may not notice this. I mean, much of what men do is to win the favor and honor of women. You know, I was listening to some Neely Fuller recently, and he, he was talking about how the knight in shining armor has always been envisioned as being a white knight. And he was talking about the subliminal messages, perhaps with the film title, Dark Knight Rises. You know, it's very interesting. But yeah, many of us black women we have a great misconception about white women, like when we refer to white women as dumb. Like when we make the claim that, oh, black men, they're only getting with white women because white women are dumb. Now, let me tell you, I have lived with white women, okay? I've had to be in girls' homes, living, sharing a home, having to share a bathroom and all that with white females. Okay, I've had white counselors, um, caseworkers, social workers. I um, and I've you know allowed my mother and I. We've allowed white females to live with us, so I am familiar with um, 
uh, white females. And I'm going to tell you right now that that is one of the biggest misconceptions that we have about white people, believing that white women are naive or dumb. Yeah, don't get me wrong. You have those who may have low self-esteem allowing for a man to just walk over them. But even these women are usually not dumb. I mean, they know what they're allowing. They just allow it because they have low self-esteem. But for the most part, white women are far from dumb and they are very crafty as well as they can be also very manipulative. And although white women have dealt with great misogyny and oppression going back to the days of ancient Greece and Rome, white women end up being the primary beneficiaries of the civilizations that have been built and taken over by their men. And usually um, they don't have to be the ones to do the dirty work in taking over these civilizations although they sit back and they reap the benefits and luxuries so there are many women who aren't trying to trade in that position despite a yearning for equality and power and the smarter ones they will know exactly how to manipulate this and take advantage of this although of course things aren't ever going to be you know totally hunky dory between the white male and white female considering the white man's strong urge to just dominate and totally control everything that exists including his women and this is why you're gonna have those who are still highly dissatisfied despite the great civilizations that the white man has supposedly built or taken over for their luxury Here's a quote from Southern female author Mary Boykin Chestnut from A Diary from Dixie, 1861. There is no slave, after all, like a wife. Poor women, poor slaves. All married women, all children and girls who live in their father's house are slaves. And this dissatisfaction eventually led to the women's suffragists and the initial wave of white feminists of the late 19th and early 20th century. Now, as y'all know, many of the white abolitionists were white feminists. But were all of these women really all that passionate about blacks obtaining freedom and fair treatment? Or was there a more selfish agenda behind these white women who supposedly were for helping blacks. Now I'm mentioning this because there are those who are trying to get people to overlook Rachel Dolezal's deceptiveness by making mention of her supposed great contributions to the black race. Note, Jim Jones, he also adopted black children and he provided housing for many poor black people, which is why he garnered so many black followers and supporters, including some black nationalists even. But anyways, you've always had white women who have just been piggybacking off of black movements for their own selfish benefits. Now, as a naive or undereducated young girl, I had a great respect for Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton after learning that they were abolitionists. But let's learn a little more about these white women who were supposedly women who fought for freedom and equality for all human beings in this nation. The history of American feminism has been primarily a narrative about the heroic deeds of white women. Beverly Guy Sheftar writes in the opening of her book, Words of Fire, an anthology of African American feminist thoughts. In this oft repeated narrative, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and a Susan B. Anthony are invoked predictably as the quintessential feminists. Although there is plenty of evidence to suggest a different narrative, such as Guy Sheftall's edited volume and the many, many volumes of Black, Latina, and Indigenous feminist writing, Stanton and Anthony have been canonized as quintessential feminists in the popular imagination. 
For evidence of this, one need look no further than the Ken Burns, Paul Barnes documentary for PBS, Not For Ourselves Alone. In the Burns Barnes version of the early women's movement in the U.S., race is barely mentioned and racism not at all. Instead, there is a comforting fiction that the women's movement grew untroubled out of the struggle for the abolition of slavery. This historical reality departs quite dramatically from this narrative and is the subject of today's installment of the Trouble with White Women series. During the mid-19th century, there were alliances between those in the abolitionist movement and those beginning to advocate for women's rights, sometimes called suffragists or suffragettes. Most notably, Frederick Douglass described himself as a woman's rights man, largely based on the influence of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Now again, for y'all who want to harp on black women being duped by white feminists, Know that black women and black men have been duped by white feminists long before the 1960s and 70s. The abolitionist movement and the women's movement split over the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which guaranteed the right to vote based on a citizen's race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Despite the early support of African American men such as Douglas, Suffragists like Stanton could not abide the idea that black men might get the franchise to vote ahead of white women. Stanton didn't hesitate to voice her opinion that white women were superior to black men and thus more deserving of the vote. Lori Ginsburg, in her biography of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, recounts some of the racial politics here. Asked straight out whether she were willing to have the colored man enfranchised before the woman, she answered, no, I would not trust him with all my rights. Degraded, oppressed himself, he would be more despotic with the governing power than even our Saxon rulers are. These were not merely figures of speech, thoughtless slips of the tongue and the pen. Rather, when she evoked these images, Stanton was drawing upon a powerful sense of her own class and cultural superiority. Yet many feminist accounts of this history dismiss and distance racism from the core values of feminism or feminist leaders. For instance, Nancy F. Cott in The Grounding of Modern Feminism locates this racism outside the movement for women's rights and shifts it to the surrounding society as in this passage. Despite links between early women's rights and anti-slavery reformers, the suffrage movement since the late 19th century had caved in to the racism of the surrounding society, sacrificing democratic principle and the dignity of black people if it seemed advantageous to white women's obtaining the vote. Here, Cott paints the women of the suffrage movement as passive victims who caved into the racism of the surrounding society rather than the active political agents that they, in fact, were. Stanton was no passive victim caving into racism of the society around her. Returning to Ginsburg, the political landscape of the late 19th century was one in which fault lines of race and gender were especially sharp, and Stanton played an active role in sustaining them and using them to her political advantage. In this passage, Ginsburg recounts some of the ways Stanton's racism was an effective mobilizing tool for the women's movement. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's positions on the relative worthiness of black men and white women as citizens. Her choice of all too familiar racist language had broad and lasting consequences, both theoretical and strategic, for the movement she had led. By claiming that some American citizens were more worthy of rights than others, Stanton helped lay the groundwork for a defense of women's rights based on race, respectability, religion, and class that would be hard to shake. 
Shirley Stanton and Anthony understood this when they reported on the formation of a white women's suffrage association in Washington, D.C., or admitted that the proposed 15th Amendment rouses woman's prejudices against the Negro while increasing his contempt and hostility toward her as an equal. Furthermore, this appeal to prejudice, whether it was an intentional strategy or not, worked. One woman wrote Stanton and Anthony's newspaper, The Revolution, to declare that she had never thought or cared about voting till the Negroes began to vote, but now felt my self-respect rise. She went on, if educated women are not as fit to decide who shall be the rulers of this country as field hands, then where's the use of culture or any brain at all? One might as well have been born on the plantation. Elizabeth Cady Stanton had been arguing for years that it was women's lack of self-respect that caused them to defer their demands. Now, white women's self-respect, as this letter writer suggested, could be heightened by comparison with people of lesser races. Pleased by evidence that women were developing their self-esteem and so would demand their rights, Stanton seemed to not have worried that advocating women's rights on this basis and severing the movement's ties to its abolitionist and anti-racist roots might damage the cause's claims to universal justice nor did she express any concern that her use of racist language to denigrate black men, along with her implicit embrace of a politics of white racial pride, might diminish the movement's appeal to African American women themselves. Whether or not she meant to endorse an explicitly racist tactic to draw new groups of white women into the cause is impossible to know. That she published the letter entitling it a Washington cover suggests that she was willing to take the risk. I'm struck here by the effective, that is, the way emotion plays into the political strategy. Stanton had identified white women's lack of self-respect, today we'd say self-esteem, as a barrier to her efforts at organizing. The woman writing into their newspaper confirms this, saying, I never had an interest in voting. What sparks the sudden boost in this woman's self-respect? The prospect of that the Negroes began to vote and then she felt my self-respect rise. There is additional evidence that the racism of the early women's movement was central rather than peripheral to the movement. In Barbara Andelson's book about racism and the women's suffrage movement, Daughters of Jefferson, Daughters of Boot Blacks, Racism and American Feminism, she observes, the white women who led this movement came to trade upon their privilege as the daughters, sisters, wives, and mothers of powerful white men in order to gain for themselves some share of the political power those men possessed. They did not adequately identify ways in which that political power would not be accessible to poor women, immigrant women, and black women. Yet despite the blatant racism and class bias of the women's suffrage movement, black women, discouraged and betrayed, continued to work for their right to vote, both as blacks and as women, through their own suffrage organizations. The Guy Shuftal anthology, Words of Fire, offers an account of continuous feminist intellectual tradition in non-fictional prose of African-American women going back to the early 19th century when abolition and suffrage were urgent political issues. Works like this one provide a useful correction to the familiar narrative of American feminism, but this history is largely unknown to most white feminists today. More than simply the absence of knowledge about black feminist intellectual tradition in the U.S., there is a real lack of awareness about the role of whiteness in shaping early feminism. An important corrective to this lack of awareness is Louise Newman's excellent book, White Women's Rights, The Racial Origins of Feminism in the U.S. Newman makes a convincing case that he developed an explicit racial ideology to promote their cause, defending patriarchy for primitives, 
while causing for its elimination among the civilized. She writes, Feminism developed in conjunction with and constituted a response to the United States extension of its authority over so-called primitive peoples, and feminism was part and parcel of the nation's attempt to assimilate those peoples whom white elites designated as their racial inferiors. Newman's argument is that in the time period between 1848 to 1920, the white woman movement, as she rightly refers to it, affirmed white women's racial similarity to white men while at the same time asserting white women's sexual difference from white men because they believe sexual differences form the bedrock of white civilization. This functional ambiguity, as Nancy F. Cott describes it, was not so ambiguous at the time. Social evolutionary theories of the time specified quite plainly that white women were both fundamentally similar to white men because of race and fundamentally different from white men because of sex. These evolutionist theories that white women were both the same as and different than white men opened up new social and political roles for white women as civilizers of the race, strengthening long-standing beliefs in white women's moral superiority. Moreover, the effort to establish the United States as an empire and the extension of missions, both domestically and abroad, fundamentally influenced the direction and content of white feminist thought in the late 19th and early 20th century. The reality is that white supremacy and feminism were completely intertwined at the root. This is not simply an old problem of a previous century or of individual white women who caved into the racism of the surrounding society. Rather, white supremacy is baked into white feminism. White feminism, if it's only focused on a kind of crude parity with white men, is not incompatible racism. In fact, many of the avowed white supremacist women I studied in my study of cyber racism view themselves as feminists. And there is nothing inconsistent between white supremacy and white feminism. That's why it's so important for a critically engaged feminist to include a commitment to racial justice. The white feminist thought shaped by evolutionist theories, imperialism, and missionary zeal continue to shape the feminist movement today. When mentioning feminism, people often write about those good, moderate feminists, feminist leaders of the 1800s. Men started organizations to abolish slavery in the 1700s. In 1794, early abolitionists held the convention of delegates from the abolition societies. Men and women continued to work against slavery in those organizations for some time without interference from feminists who were known then as women's rights proponents or suffragists. In the 1800s, Early feminists repeatedly entered anti-slavery intemperance organizations or alcohol prohibition organizations for the purpose of forcing feminism into other agendas. Their demands for leadership by most radical feminists were often rejected. They tried to abuse the abolitionism and temperance movements for their own cause. William Lloyd Garrison's American Anti-Slavery Society split over his pro-feminism and refusal to allow members to engage in any political remedy. Most members of his organization went on to form other organizations, leaving him with few supporters. He tried to disband the organization unsuccessfully in 1866, retired, then tried to credit the end of slavery to himself. The 14th Amendment was in the works of Congress the same year. The 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868 with the 15th Amendment likely to be to give people of all races the right to vote. But the 15th Amendment did not specify sex. Susan B. Anthony and her friends became so furious that they began to oppose the ballot for people of colors other than white. Anthony and Stanton joined George Train, a notorious racist, on a speaking tour in 1867, then accepted funding from him to start their newspaper, The Revolution. Much information exists on this facet of the early women's movement, although not in popular media or school texts sanitized by feminist censors. 
Elizabeth Cady Stanton made crude public racist remarks in her speeches while Susan B. Anthony made veiled, slippery racist comments. Did you know that Susan B. Anthony refused to speak out against lynching? Sometimes a refusal to speak, especially by someone who is in the business of speaking, can have sad consequences. Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Matilda Jocelyn Gage formed a separate suffrage organization against the vote for African American men, the National Woman Suffrage Association. The NWSA and the AWSA were eventually reunited. Anthony chose Carrie Catt to take her place as NAWSA president. Carrie Chapman Catt, another close associate of Anthony's, was of course also a racist. It's a shame that Anthony asked for censorship of all history that reflected badly on others from her biography. We'll probably never find all of the truth about her and other early feminists. And listen to how white feminists and so-called abolitionists tried to sabotage the efforts of journalist and civil rights leader Ida B. Wells. In 1893, journalist and early civil rights pioneer Ida B. Wells crossed the Atlantic for the first time to deliver that sobering message to Great Britain. She had hoped to sway public opinion about the racial violence that plagued the U.S. The lynching of black men and women seemed to have become a sport among southern white mobs, reaching a peak of 161 deaths in 1892. That included the hanging of three black businessmen, one a close friend of Wales, during that year in her former home of Memphis, Tennessee. She called for blacks to leave the city, which will never protect our lives and property. More than 6,000 black residents left, and many others boycotted white businesses. Wales was exiled. But the Memphis murders sparked the beginning of Wales' anti-lynching crusade. Combing through statistics and interviewing eyewitnesses, she conducted the first in-depth investigation into the real reasons behind the lynchings of these black men, and many others who were mostly accused of allegedly raping a white woman. She wrote about her tragic findings in a column for the New York Age newspaper and forged the modern day civil rights movement. Wells was one of those driven people who never looked to the left or to the right. If something needed to be said or done, she just goes and does it, says Paula Giddings, the Elizabeth A. Woodson 1922 professor in Afro-American studies at Smith College in an interview with The Root. She doesn't worry about the consequences. As the nation approached the 20th century, Wells saw that the spate of racial injustice needed to be addressed in a new and direct manner through outright protest and self-defense. That challenged the nation's moralistic Victorian attitudes at the time. Such a grounded stance also pitted her against one of the most formidable American leaders within the movement to gain women the vote or suffrage Francis E. Willard, national president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Throughout much of the 1800s, the women's alcohol temperance movement was a powerful force in the greater push towards women's suffrage. Meanwhile, many suffrage leaders, such as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, had also championed black equality. Yet in 1870, the suffragists found themselves on opposing ends of the equal rights battle when Congress passed the 15th Amendment enabling black men to vote, at least in theory, and not women. That measure engendered resentment among some white suffragists, especially in the South. To Willard, giving women the right to vote was the only way to rid the U.S. of evils of intemperance. She couched this view in the organization's mission of home protection. It was a view that garnered her much support within the WCTU, which had 250,000 members and chapters in just about every state. She was even willing to court white Southern women at the expense of blacks, even though her parents had been abolitionists. Better whiskey and more of it is the rallying cry of the dark-faced mobs, Willard said in an 1890 interview with the New York Voice. The safety of white women, of childhood, of the home is menaced in a thousand localities. That statement and others incensed Wells. 
She was angered even more by the fact that Willard was considered to be a friend within the black community, in part because some of the WCTU chapters had accepted black women as members. But the WCTU president unhesitatingly slandered the entire Negro race in order to gain favor with those who are hanging, shooting, and burning Negroes alive, Wells said in her autobiography, Crusade for Justice. Giddings, who wrote the biography, Ida, A Sword Among Lions, says that Wells knew that in order to bring change, she needed to expose the truth, that too many white liberals were doing nothing to oppose crimes against black Southerners. She was also pushing to gain financial and political backing from the British people. Wells always understood that one of her most difficult challenges was to get the liberals in line, said Giddings. If Wales failed in Great Britain, all could be lost. Wales laid the groundwork for the anti-lynching crusade in 1893 when she arrived in Great Britain for the first time. British Quaker Catherine Empey, an activist and publisher who supported racial equality, invited Wales to speak at churches and other gatherings. Wales was also interviewed by British news publications. Just about everywhere, she was asked why she had traveled so far. Her response, our country remains silent on those continued outrages. It is to the religious and moral sentiment of Great Britain we turn. While many of the British believed that lynching was a scourge in the U.S., they had a hard time believing that women like Willard could ignore the problems. They even heralded Willard as the uncrowned queen of American democracy. Wells had to find a way to dispel the myth. She finally got her chance to take on Willard during a second visit to Great Britain for the anti-lynching campaign. Willard was in England as the guest of Lady Henry Somerset, head of the British temperance movement. Both women were invited to speak before British temperance advocates on May 9, 1894. Wells had to be strategic in her speech said Crystal Feimster, assistant professor of African-American studies and African studies at Yale University in an interview with The Root. Wells saw that if she could nail Willard down, she would be able to harness a huge political force in the US. During that era, the social sciences were being used to justify unequal treatment according to race, Giddings said. They were employed to show that blacks are inherently inferior in terms of their blood and makeup of the body, she said. As a result, they are less civilized and are actually regressing to a savagery. Wells came to the lecture armed with a copy of the 1890 interview with the New York Voice that echoed such racist thinking. Willard had told the publication that the local tavern is the Negro center of power. The colored race multiplies like the locusts of Egypt. When asked her opinion of Willard, Wells chose to read the interview. With Willard at her side and little time to actually speak, Wells asked the audience how influential white women could continue to turn a blind eye to the white mobs who threatened black lives. Afterward, she was able to get a British journal, The Fraternity, to reprint Willard's interview. Lady Somerset was so enraged by Wells' commentary that she demanded that the fraternity article not be printed or Wells would never be heard in Britain again. The article was published anyway. Lady Somerset also sent a telegram to black abolitionist Frederick Douglass demanding that he publicly reprimand Wells. Douglass didn't give in to Lady Somerset's demands, yet Ida B. Wells later sadly noted in a letter to Douglas that he did little to fully support her overseas campaign. Lady Somerset and Willard were not done. Pushing to publicly embarrass Wells in the press, the pair arranged for another Willard interview with the Westminster Gazette, a London newspaper. This time it was conducted by Somerset, who gave Willard a platform for her version. Willard talked about her family background and expressed concern for the plight of blacks, but she also stated that the best people I knew in the South had told her black people were threatening the safety of white women and children. She continued, it is not fair that a plantation Negro who can neither read or write should be entrusted with the ballot. 
Other U.S. publications, including the Memphis Commercial, weighed in with statements against Wells' character. The commercial examined her career, painting the saddle-colored Safara from Holly Springs, Mississippi, as a harlot. The newspaper also stated that Wells was pushing her foul and slanderous outburst on the British. Even so, the media campaign didn't stop Wells. She lectured to audiences in London, was invited to dinner in Parliament, and before she headed home, helped Londoners establish the London Anti-Lynching Committee. Forming this group was a clear victory for Wells in the anti-lynching crusade. It comprised some of the most influential editors, ministers, college professors, and members of the parliament. To Wells' surprise, Lady Somerset joined the committee, and Willard was among the Americans who also signed on. With the victory in hand, Wells set sail for home after a four-month campaign. She later wrote in her autobiography that the moment was not only a boomerang to Miss Willard, it seemed to appeal to the British sense of fair play. Here were two prominent white women joining hands in the efforts to crush an insignificant colored woman who had neither the money nor influence, nothing but the power of truth with which to fight her battles. The truth prevailed. And I want you to hear quotes from some famous white feminist suffragists and abolitionists. Susan B. Anthony, social reformer, member of the Anti-Slavery Society, president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. What words can express her or the white woman's humiliation when at the close of this long conflict, the government which she had served so faithfully held her unworthy of a voice in its councils while it recognized as the political superiors of all the noble women of this nation, the Negro men just emerged from slavery and not only totally illiterate, but also densely ignorant of every public question. Another quote from her, Susan B. Anthony, Mr. Douglas, that is Mr. Frederick Douglas, talks about the wrongs of the Negro, but with all the outrages that he today suffers, he would not exchange his sex and take the place of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. <laughs> so basically, she's saying that um, it's, it's easier for a Frederick Douglas than it is for a white woman, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. That sounds very similar to what I have heard um, more recently in regards to Barack Obama. <laughs> Here's a quote from Elizabeth Cady Stanton, social activist, abolitionist, and author. What will we and our daughters suffer if these degraded black men are allowed to have the rights that would make them even worse than our Saxon fathers? Anna Howard Shaw. Physician, Methodist Minister, President of the National Woman Suffrage Association. You have put the ballot in the hands of your black men, thus making them political superiors of white women. Never before in the history of the world have men made former slaves the political masters of their former mistresses. Belle Kearney, orator, novelist, Mississippi State Senator. The enfranchisement of woman would ensure immediate and durable white supremacy honestly attained, for upon unquestioned authority it is stated that in every southern state but one there are more educated women than all the illiterate voters, white and black, native and foreign combined, as you probably know. Of all the women in the south who can read and write, ten out of every eleven are white, when it comes to the proportion of property between the races, that of the white outweighs that of the black immeasurably. Laura Clay, founder of Kentucky's first suffrage group. The white men reinforced by the educated white women could snow under the Negro vote in every state and the white race would maintain its supremacy without corrupting or intimidating the Negroes. Carrie Chapman Catt, founder of the League of Women Voters. White supremacy will be strengthened, not weakened by women's suffrage. Rebecca Ann Latimer Felton, first woman to serve in the Senate. 
I do not want to see a Negro man walk to the polls and vote on who should handle my tax money while I myself cannot vote at all. When there is not enough religion in the pulpit to organize a crusade against sin, nor justice in the courthouse to promptly punish crime, nor manhood enough in the nation to put a sheltering arm about innocence and virtue, if it needs lynching to protect a woman's dearest possession from the ravening human beast, then I say lynch. Lynch a thousand times a week if necessary. So, considering all that I have just read to you, it is undeniable that white women have been equal partners with white men in white racism and in the establishment of white supremacy. As Tariq Nasheed described, these white women's suffrages were basically the more female version of the KKK. And just know that they gave a cold shoulder to black women who were also fighting for women's rights, although they claimed to be all about equality. And let me mention another feminist icon. Margaret Sanger was an American sex educator, nurse, and birth control activist, as well as the founder of the American Birth Control League and Planned Parenthood. She is held by many women for being a leader in the liberation of female sexuality, giving females the option to choose for themselves, but many people are not aware that Margaret Sanger aligned herself with the eugenicists whose ideology prevailed in the early 20th century. Eugenicists strongly espoused racial supremacy and purity, particularly in the Aryan race. Eugenicists hoped to purify the bloodlines and improve the race by encouraging the fit to reproduce and the unfit to restrict their reproduction. They sought to contain the inferior races through segregation, sterilization, birth control, and abortion. We don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, was a devout racist who spoke at Klan rallies and who created the Negro Project designed to sterilize unknowing black women and others she deemed as undesirables of society. In her own words, colored people are like human weeds and are to be exterminated. And yes, I am generalizing now. I am speaking in general, okay? Because I do realize that there are whites who were sincere in their efforts to fight against racism, inequality, and discrimination. But you have to understand that many of these women were just piggybacking off of blacks and black movements for freedom and equality. They were doing this for their own selfish benefits. And they did the same thing in the 60s and 70s, piggybacking off of the civil rights movement with the second wave of feminism. Consider the case of Gloria Steinem. American feminist, journalist, and sociopolitical activist Gloria Steinem became nationally recognized as a leader of and media spokeswoman for the women's liberation movement in the late 60s and 70s. But there has been evidence showing that Ms. Steinem actually worked for the CIA. Gloria first came across the radar of black men in 1978 when Steinem put a book called Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman on the cover of Ms. Magazine, the magazine which she controlled. The book was written by a black feminist and activist named Michelle Wallace, who came out of nowhere. Wallace was in her early 20s at the time, yet she was being touted as the leader of black feminism. In the book, Wallace called abolitionists like Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth ugly and stupid for supporting black men. She called black revolutionaries chauvinist macho pigs and advised black women to go it alone. Gloria Steinem said that Wallace's book would define the future of black relationships and she pushed hard to make sure the book received massive publicity. Gloria Steinem's work triggered a flood of hate black men books and films that continue to this day. Needless to say, some were quite suspicious of Ms. Magazine and Gloria Steinem. Why was Steinem sticking her nose into the affairs of the black community? So people started doing some research on Steinem. When it came out that Gloria Steinem was probably the ghostwriter of the book with Michelle and Wallace's name on it, Wallace had a nervous breakdown and went into hiding for two years. Unfortunately, the damage was already done. 
white women were able to convince many black women that black men were not considering their needs as women. And once again, let me mention Gloria Steinem's more recent comments on President Barack Obama when she was um, like campaigning for Hillary Clinton, because what she said, it sounded very much like what white women were claiming back in the days of the women's suffrages, trying to make themselves appear powerless in comparison to black men. Like when these Bill Cosby accusers, they tried to make the claim that they didn't report Bill Cosby assaulting them because he was supposedly so powerful. Now, we're supposed to believe that this supposedly powerful man, his word would be believed and heard over white women. When has that ever really happened in history? History has shown that even if a white woman were to suggest that a black man disrespected her in any sort of way, regardless of his class or status, he could very promptly be lynched. But they want to give you this impression that they have less power than the black male, although they believe that they are still more superior than the black male. It was the idea that the Negro male was inferior to the Caucasian female that actually fed into and boosted the self-respect or self-esteem of white women. Here is what Susan B. Anthony, an early feminist who was supposedly an abolitionist, said in a letter to Frederick Douglass in 1869. The old anti-slavery school says that women must stand back, that they must wait until male Negroes are voters. But we say, if you will not give the whole loaf of justice to an entire people, give it to the most intelligent first. If intelligence, justice, and morality are to be placed in the government, then let the question of women be brought up first and that of the Negro last. Now, in consideration of all that I have presented and in consideration of history, if we are going to talk about Rachel Dolezal, if I'm saying her name correctly, especially if we are going to talk in defense of Rachel Dolezal, we need to consider all of this and we need to question ourselves or at least inquire into what were the real intentions behind Rachel Dolezal, Dolezal posing for years as a black woman. We have to really consider did she perhaps have any selfish intentions in posing as a black woman for years, despite all that she may have done to positively influence black people or to help black people? I plan to delve more into that in my next video.